Okay. Didn't mean to unshare. Can you share again? Mm. Yeah. Hello. I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of Digital Futures to the uh, Deep Green Biodesign in the Age of AI um, session. My name is Neil Leacham. I'm one of the originators of this project, along with Philip Yuan at the University of Tongjin in uh, Shanghai. Today's session is a, a very special session. It's a, an all-female lineup. Um, and we're also we're delighted to be able to be, to be joined by Rachel Armstrong for the panel discussion at the end. Uh, Rachel is, is well known in her own right as one of the leaders in the field of biodesign. And I, to my mind, I just want to say a few words about this because it seemed to me that uh, this is a particularly special session. Um, it combines two of the key interests that are behind, um, bio uh, behind uh, digital futures, biodesign itself and the question about AI. It seems to me um, vitally important today that we should be paying attention to the environment itself. Not only is there a long tradition in architecture um, going back from uh, Antonio Gaudi to Fray Otto and way beyond that, um, which has looked towards uh, the, the natural world, to bio, towards biology, for a source of inspiration for how to inform architectural design itself. But above all that, there is the kind of issue of how, uh, from a kind of environmental point of view, the ecology, the very, very fragile ecology of the earth is a very um, important kind of ethical concern to address these days. <clears throat> Alongside that, um, we have the issue of AI, something that has really burst onto the scene in, the, in recent years and has had a huge impact on architectural culture. Many of our sessions have been about AI, and it's great to be able to sort of see for the first time AI being really introduced to the to the domain of, of bio design. One of the um, this is this is a, 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 a session that's been curated in many ways by uh, Claudia Pasquero, someone who also probably needs no introduction. Um, she is both a professor in Innsbruck and a lecturer at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, and uh, one of the leaders in the field. Um, uh, what is what is so, to my mind, so rewarding about this particular kind of session is it really is articulating what we were hoping to do in the first place. In other words, to have these thematized panels that were addressing things in, in a way that was somehow a combination of, um, well, we see it as being a kind of TED talk and an, and an issue of architectural design. A TED talk in that it's free. These are short um, uh, contributions, but it's necessarily free. And secondly, it's arranged in a thematized way, much like architectural design. But importantly, these things are more spontaneous, much more immediate than architectural design. I'm, um, I've signed a contract with Matthias Del Campo to, to publish and an, to edit an issue of architectural design on AI. And the first, in, the first inquiry was made in 2018. The issue won't come out till 2022. But what we're able to do here is to, um, uh, very spontaneously uh, address these questions and address them for free, which is, which is a, a wonderful thing. And also to be able to broadcast these ideas around the world. Um, la after last session on last sa Saturday, I had a long discussion with some, some, some students in, in Egypt who were just saying how grateful they were that these ideas were being broadcast everywhere and everywhere for free. So I'm going to hand over to, to Claudia Pasquero. Um, uh, uh, Sha will be um, chairing the session itself. And um, after uh, the, the presentation and after a few questions from, from Sha, we will be, um, Rachel and I will be joining the discussion. Uh, I'd like to invite those in uh, following on Billy Billy and YouTube to submit your own questions. We can't guarantee we'll get through all of them, but we will try to do our best. Um, and I'd like to, to um, hand over to uh, Claudia Pasquero and say, um, welcome, 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 Claudia. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for the introduction. I look forward to the debate. I would like to first uh, um, introduce uh, uh, the panel today. Uh, I think it's great that uh, we can uh, debate this issue and share this platform with the senior and junior researcher today. So um, with us, we have uh, uh, Teresa Greskova. Teresa is uh, uh, senior lecturer in Innsbruck University as well as PhD candidate uh, um, she's also a long-term collaborator of the Ecologic Studio, the practice that I co-founded with Marco Boletto. And uh, um, today uh, she will discuss uh, uh, first a project she's been collaborating with us on photosynthetic architecture and then transition to her PhD work on the relationship between um, human and non-human intelligence in architecture. Thank you, Teresa, for joining us. 
Uh, we are with us also Maria Kapsova. Maria Kapsova is a, a senior researcher in Innsbruck University, as well as PhD candidate. Um, her, her PhD focuses on the role of aesthetic and biotechnology and intelligence in design. Today, Maria will mainly share a teaching research project, uh, uh, some beautiful one that you've been developing at the University of Innsbruck Synthetic Landscape Lab. Thank you, Maria, for joining. Uh, we have with us also Xiao Wang. Uh, Xiao we, has prepared for us a few questions uh, that we will debate with the other um, uh, participant and researcher here. Uh, Xiao has been graduating from the Barth B Pro in my studio. And um, she's now starting a PhD uh, in digital theory under um, the supervision of Mario Carpo and myself, uh, which explore the human in architecture through biocomputational design with abductive reasoning. One of the subjects of interest of Xiao is abductive reasoning and she might tell us something about it uh, during the conversation. And finally, we have with us also Irini Tsumoku, which uh, in a way today represent more the practice side. Irini is a, a project manager in Ecology Studio, is, is great, uh, doing a great job in managing various projects we have at the moment on design innovation. She's also, as all of us, collaborating with academia as she is a cluster leader at, with me at the Bartlett UCL. And again, I really would like to thank uh, uh, Neil for the invitation and Rachel Armstrong, which I know since a long time and I always enjoy discussing with um, Professor for Experimental Architecture for joining the debate and the conversation. I'm sure that will be great. Uh, before we see the presentation for the rest of the, the, uh, the guests, I have prepared a small introduction that frame some of the topic I, I would like somehow to initiate or discuss today. Of course, the other can then steer the conversation in other direction. So I'll share my screen to start. So uh, the title of today's uh, conversation is Deep Green Biodesign in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, this uh, is also uh, the title of a forthcoming book uh, I'm uh, co-authoring with Marco Poletto, which will be published next year and will feature uh, the work of many of the people present here and, and others as well. Of course, the team is uh, uh, larger. Um, addressing the, the research, uh, teaching, as well as practice project we are developing in the last uh, 10 years. Um, in this uh, short introduction, I would like to go through some of the topics that are most relevant for me, and I would like to start from uh, the role of aesthetic and biodigital aesthetic as value system of post-Anthropocene architecture. I will have, uh, let's say, a short um, discussion about these, and I will um, use as, as some of the ground of this discussion um, a simulation with Fisarium polycephalum that we developed uh, um, for um, decorator exhibition Anthropocene Island in BioTalin, Tallinn Architecture Biennale 2017, um, in which many of the present speakers have been participating, in which we had the honor to have also a project from Rachel. So one of the topics we discuss in the case of uh, Italian architectural Biennale is that it is timely within the Anthropocene era more than ever before to search for a non-anthropocentric mode of reasoning and therefore designing. The photosynthetic consortium that we established just after the Biennale and which include London-based practice ecologic studio the Urban Morphogenesis Lab at the Bartlett and the Synthetic Landscape Lab at Innsbruck University has been pursuing architecture as a research-based practice, exploring the interdependence of digital and biological intelligence in design by working directly with non-human living organisms, such as Fisarium polycephalum that you see here, um, 
cyanobacteria, but also form of artificial intelligence. The research focuses on the diagrammatic capacity of these organisms in the process of growing and becoming part of a complex biodigital architecture. A key remit of this project is training architect sensibility a recognizing pattern of reasoning across disciplines, materiality, and technological regime, thus expanding the practice repertoire of aesthetic quality. This apart from the observation, the recent development in evolutionary psychology demonstrate that human sense of beauty and pleasure is part of a co-evolutionary system of mind and the surrounding environment. In this term, human sense of beauty and pleasure have evolved as a selection mechanism. Cultivating and enhancing them compensate and integrate the function of logical thinking to gain a systemic view of planet Earth and the dramatic changes it is currently undergoing. This talk and the book that will follow seeks to illustrate a series of teaching, research, and studio projects our new appreciation of beauty in architecture has evolved with an operational tool to design and measure its aqua ecological intelligence. One of the main chapters that we will encounter is the chapter that focus on the aspect of territorial landscape um, aspect, here represented by the title Deep Green. To discuss Deep Green, I will go through a couple of projects. One is a project from a, a recent graduate at the Bartlett, and the other is a project we have been uh, initiated with the United Nations Developing Program that allow us to develop a specific algorithm called Ganfizarion, for which uh, we are developing at the moment an installation for the Center Pompidou in Paris. Ubiquitous computing enables us to decipher the biosphere anthropogenic dimension, what we have elsewhere named the urban sphere. This machinic perspective unveils a new post-anthropocenic reality where the impact of artificial system on the natural biosphere is indeed global, but their agency is no longer entirely human. This project explores a protocol to design the urban sphere, or what we may call the urbanization of the non-human. This project was titled Deep Green. With the development of Deep Green, our team is testing the potential to bring at the core of architecture and urban design research the interdependence of digital and biological intelligence. This is achieved by developing a biocomputational design workflow that enables pairing what is algorithmically drawn with what is biologically grown. In other words, and in more detail, this project illustrates how GAN generative adversarial network algorithms can be trained to behave alike a Fisarium polystephanum, an unicellular organism endowed with surprising computational ability and self organizing behavior that have made it popular among scientists and engineers alike. The trained GAN Fisarium that we see here is developed as a transcalar urban design technique to test the potential of Fisarium polycephalum intelligence in tackling problem of urban remetabolization and in computing scenario of urban morphogenesis within a non-human conceptual framework. Here we see the GAN Fisario applied uh, transcalary to the city of Paris from the scale of the city uh, to the scale of the center Pompidou that you see here transformed by uh, Fisario. The next chapter or second main chapter of this research is Photosynthetica, which will be 
illustrated through a series of uh, past projects, but uh, especially um, I will mainly talk about the system that then uh, has been implemented in research design innovation project with the pharmaceutical inter industry. To promote, to promote the evolution of this contents in the practice context, our team has reached to launch the photosynthetic adventure, a transdisciplinary design innovation project. The venture in the last two years has built a series of large scale one-to-one -one demonstrator of photosynthetic building membrane sometimes also referred to as photosynthetic urban curtain. It's a system photosynthetic integrate three layers of functionality, the wetware, the selection and management of microagriculture, the software, the digital management system, it uses sensor to optimize the performance in real time. It also provides long-term projection and prediction of the system carbon capturing and air cleaning ability. The hardware, the artificial habitat for the cultivation of living culture or photobioreactor. The project combines digital design and fabrication technology to optimize aesthetic quality and environmental performance and architectural integration. There are significant economical, social, environmental and health benefits in the actualization of photosynthetic in this scenario and at a large scale of the building facade. The project embody the multi-generational long-term benefit of adopting a carbon absorbing technology. As it is 10 times more efficient at carbon sequestration than any other green technology currently based on conventional planning and large trees. This is due to the exceptional property of the cyanobacteria, the microalgae organisms, will cell are entirely photosynthetic. By comparison, large plants devote more than 90% of their mass to infrastructure they sustain the need to their complex organisms, but have no direct contribution to solar energy capturing and health filtering. The photosynthetic project is driven by a strong technological agenda, and as such, it can be defined as design innovation venture. However, at this course, line of fundamental realization that we have matured in several years of design research. Architectural technology must not lose sight of its aesthetic dimension, its beauty. It should be clear by now that this is critical, especially in the Anthropocene age, a time when perhaps paradoxically, the non-anthropocentric model reasoning is becoming ubiquitous. Photosynthetica rely its in daily functioning on combination of digital, human, and non-human intelligence. Its crucial role is to interfere this form of reasoning, to create channel of communication and crop fertilization, and to stimulate, in other words, our corrective sensibility in recognizing pattern of reasoning across discipline, materiality, and technological domain. To conclude, I would like to, I will go through a couple of projects presented in future and past exhibition that enable us to to, to develop a conclusion on, on some of this project. At the end of the journey, we can attempt to draw full concluding remarks that are driving our current and future experimentation. As I mentioned earlier, we now believe that a key remit of our practice is training our sensibilities as well as what the one of our partners and clients a recognizing pattern of reasoning across discipline, materiality, and technological regime thus expanding the practice repertoire of aesthetic quality. Aesthetic here is intended as a meta-language, enabling a more sophisticated level of communication with the non-human. It is therefore no longer a case of architecture being inspired by other disciplines, such as biology and computer science, and striving to become biomimetic or biophilic. Rather, it might be time to realize what architecture can give to other disciplines precisely because of its self-contained artificiality in terms of contributing to their actualization in a new and reimagined spatial reality. Architecture, as an embedded algorithm, acquires its non-human intelligence and sensitivity, which might be spatially trained and cultivated. For this reason, we feel that it is critical to avoid the trap of simply borrowing ever new tools and technology and apply them to the solution of an ever-increasing architectural challenge. Rather, it is critical to deploy them as technique, 
to, ascend, to access the inhuman, to shift perspective beyond the boundary of the rational. Such shift has the power to greatly expand the space of solution by reproblematizing re given problems. And there has probably never been a more significant and challenging time for architect to claim this fundamental societal role. And on this, I conclude my introduction and I, on the deep green, and I will leave uh, um, share the platform to Maria Kapsova that will present synthetic landscape. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia, for the great introduction. I share my screen. Um, okay, it should work now. So yeah, and I'm happy to present work that we are developing at the Synthetic Landscape Lab together with Professor Claudia Pasquero and uh, our students. And uh, I will try to make it short. I don't promise that I fit in 10 minutes. I try to record myself. Um, uh, so, because there's a lot of projects. So I just give a little introduction of the synthetic landscape. Now we, it's a design philosophy that we develop within our lab that encompasses all the processes and systems, human, animal, microbiological, digital, that are currently accelerating the transformation of our urban sphere. And we see that this, the stratum of the landscape or of the synthetic landscape is a repository of the microclimates, uh, microchemical compositions, digital data flows, geological catastrophes, technical traces, interspecies interaction recorded in time. So an enormous amount of data trapped in the layers of the landscape. And if we decode this data scapes by drawing and simulating the complex web of relationships, we might unfold synthetic forms of intelligence embedded in the morphology of the landscape. And from the numerical perspective of machine learning, notions as a flow, movement, form, style can be all described as distributions of a pattern. Those to study intelligence of synthetic landscape would mean to study the manner by which information flows and patterns are absorbed and treated by AI. And instead of treating AI as a machine of hallucination, we will consider machine learning as an instrument of knowledge magnification that helps to perceive features, patterns, and correlations through the vast spaces of data beyond human reach. And rather than treating it as an alien cognition, AI, uh, we are considering as an instrument to see and navigate the space of knowledge. We are using computational methods to analyze patterns in historical culture in the available digitized text archives in order to form new definitions of synthetic landscape. And now I'm presenting you the project by Stefan Siegel, uh, it's our diploma students with Claudia Pasquera, who is actually working and developing the project on the sphere, trying to decode the landscape or code and embed different layers of information within the landscape. You know? And um, in order to understand the pattern, uh, which is hidden within the physical form, the digital pattern, which is hidden in the physical form. And I go to the next exploration uh, uh, between uh, with uh, Marco Paletta and Claudio Pasquera in our lab. And this project called the Synthetic Landscape as well. And uh, we are looking to the uh, Alt region as a body of knowledge again. And we are trying to recreate and decode the uh, digital morphologies through the set of mathematical drawings in order to create inter-objective relationships between the different layers of information which are and be between the different layers of assemblages, which are comprising time and space. And uh, we are trying to decode it with the uh, mathematical drawings, which are looking to the uh, glacier, in this case, as again, a datascape which consider a different layers of information. If, if we think, you know, the each glacier uh, in each molecule of ice crystal could, could contain the information which is uh, belonging to the ages before actually the human was inhabiting the planet. And what is very interesting for me the, and for us that the crystal solid 
is a material now we uh, whose like atoms, molecules, and ions are arranged in the way uh, to create the specific crystal structure, which is directly affected by the temperature and uh, humidity and the different factors of the environment. So by studying the formation of the ice crystal, we can actually see the um the history of the climate change the history of our planet now and uh i'm showing you the drawings again of our students in liana randa and manuel parkman and here of joy polis and jens burkat who are studying the pr different projects on this topic and by describing these flows of water these flows of data we can basically decode and start thinking on this layers of information how we could uh, navigate it, how we could inhabit it, and how we could actually read some type of intelligence hidden and embedded within the body of the landscape, within the body of probably synthetic landscape. And I bring you again to the territory of uh, uh, Alps, and this is a project of by Matthias Wienetzer, uh, who is looking to the um, Alps region, to the landscape, as a, a system of a human machine and a landscape interaction. So basically he's decoding uh, the landscape with the drones. He's using the drones as a system which could basically take the information from the landscape, re-evaluate it and uh, start modifying the unused landscape uh, in order to create the inhabitable space for humans. And what is interesting here for us that uh, in this process, there are different types of, of uh, agency and different types of intelligency are present in the design uh, formation, in the design process itself. No? But basically, the drone is the system which is uh, technological and algorithmic, no? which is capturing the information, processing it, and applying different forms um, of material deposition the landscape, which has its, per, its uh, uh, pertinent qualities, the slope, the conditions of the humidity, the conditions of the temperature, no? and the human who is acting still on the side and starting to uh, reduce, like, uh, like rare inhabit this space. So basically, there are three types of intelligency, uh, three types of agency, which are acting on the side in order to create the new uh, formation and your image of the landscape. And uh, um, I switch to the next project of uh, Carmelian Enzinger, who is looking to the same regions, uh, uh, to the different regions. I, I'm moving ourselves from the Alps now and looking, but, but looking to the same principles of the decoding the patterns of the landscape in order to create an architectural proposal. And he is looking to the ideas of the, uh, into the method of the erosion of the landscape in order to define uh, the, in order to understand the slopes, in order to understand the hydromorphology uh, of the landscape. And here are some tests that he's doing. And if we start to look into these patterns uh, of the distribution of the, uh, of the humidity and distribution of the water patterns within the landscape, we can start. We can start thinking that if we uh, apply this geological intelligence in the design process, we probably start uh, looking to our city from the absolutely different perspective. What if we take the water flow of the specific area and start thinking on the distribution of our habitat based on this flow? And here we are using the. Uh, gun uh, analysis in, or, in order to start. Huh? Sorry, Philip, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you so much. In order to start creating a new inhabitable landscape and to create the new uh, proposals for the uh, water distributions. And what if we take a different uh, type of intelligence that Claudia was also mentioning before as a Fizarum polyceferus, uh, the slime mold, 
which can which has uh, its own biological intelligence and we start thinking what if we uh, use this method as a way of computation uh, of computing uh, our living environment the city fabric basically and what if we uh, try to create the game of Fizarum that's a project by Thierry Lopez and our lab you know, uh, where Fizarum is basically becoming a game machine uh, uh, like a gaming agent and starting to redescribe the distribution of the connection within the cities in order to save the water and start to create a different habit as well. And um, another uh, type of intelligence that I like to mention, uh, which is again the biological, is the mycelium. There is the set of the project that we are developing with the students, uh, which takes uh, the mycelium again as a driving uh, force for design. And uh, we are taking the idea of the internet of the forest, you know, which basically mycelium is it in order to start creating a different set of interrelation in their relation within the landscape and may maybe within the city a project by claudia handler who is studying this networks in order to uh, create the system of uh, mycelium which prevent the erosion of the landscape but what if we switch from the idea of the mycelium as a erosion to the idea of a recreation um, of the landscape, which could become uh, actually productive. Now, what if we can start creating some uh, structures which could uh, which could create a new type of the functions? But what is interesting about the mycelium, which excites me every time, that mycelium is basically becoming a biosensor, which is uh, uh, which is transmitting the information from one uh, type. Uh, like for, for example, from one plant to another one. And what if we can hack this type of uh, uh, communication which is present in the nature and starting to uh, use it for the uh, for creating the interrelations within the city. And these are some proposals that uh, our students, now it's for Project by Charles Virion, are doing in order to create these mycelium structures. I switch to the next project by Stefan Fuchs, who is working with the uh, bees uh, intelligence. And here, maybe from the idea of the landscape, we are switching to the idea of the uh, kind of, of the morphology, you know, how we could, for example, use the properties and the uh, ideas of the distribution of the morphologies done by the bees in order to create some architectural proposals. And Stefan is uh, uh, doing uh, uh, in, actually in his uh, personal farm uh, when he's, where he's producing honey, he's doing some experiments and tests in order to see how we could uh, understand the structure of the, uh, the logic of the uh, bees formations in order to apply it uh, to his proposal. And what if we can uh, start thinking on this kind of uh, production within the uh, mountain region as something uh, as something um, like ch basically changing the idea of the production uh, within the alpine region. Mm. I will. I, th I see that I'm going over the time, so I switch another project. And basically, I want to maybe conclude with the idea of uh, thinking about ourselves as well and the way how we uh, perceive our uh, infrastructures as a human. What is the role? What is the role of the human here? And there is a project of the Dominic Wagner who is working on the idea of the uh, new type of the transportation, and uh, he's redescri like redescribing, uh, reforming the uh, topography of a Lisbon with the erosion mechanism in order to create a system uh, which could be hosting a new airport there and uh, starting to think how we could redescribe how we could redefine the idea of the uh, human transportation in the region. I just go here and uh, what if we are actually using uh, the natural logic 
uh, of the hydrogen lithography using the logic of the uh, natural production uh, for um, for the airport uh, construction. I don't know. I think I'm just going over time, and I just conclude here with that, and I give my words uh, to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thanks a lot. A beautiful presentation. In the meantime, I see that uh, Philip Beasley has joined us. Uh, thanks, Philip, uh, to be with us, and it's great to have you in the final conversation. Uh, Philip Beasley is a professor at the School of Architecture in Waterloo, uh, the Electoral of Living Architectural System and of Riverside Architectural Press. Nice to have you here. So, um, hi, hi, Philip. Last time we met was one of my last uh, in-person lecture, I guess, in Madrid. <laughs> nice to see you. So um, our next speaker is uh, Teresa, that as I mentioned before, will start from the photosynthetic approach and then transition to a research on biosensing and her PhD research. Thank you, Teresa, you can start. Thank you, Claudia. I will uh, start sharing my screen. I uh, titled the presentation, uh, the lecture for today, Photosynthetic Architectures and Ecology of Emotional Freedom. The photosynthetic architectures are powered by microalgae organisms. One of the oldest organisms on Earth, microalgae and cyanobacteria, are able to grow in every aquatic habitat. The projects are developed in collaboration with these organisms during the prototype, uh, turning the prototype into a performative living sculpture where the notion of living takes on a new form of artificiality. The Urban Algae Folly project by Ecologic Studio merged biological and artificial life in richly articulated architectural components receptive to urban stimuli. These seek to conjure a new circularity of information, matter, and energy, where what one system emits, the other feeds onto. Algae growth is dependent on the amount of CO2 that is fed with but also depend on environmental conditions that can be systematically optimized with the architectural prototype in order to maximize the growth rate and pollution absorption. Algae primarily function as metabolic machines deployed to convert and digest pollutants found in air and in the waterways by means of process known as photosynthesis. CO2 emissions are absorbed and oxygen is released back to the atmosphere. The microorganisms grow faster in the biodigital environments than in the wild because in these artificial environments, they are very closely connected with human life. Man-made emissions like heat and carbon dioxide, for instance, stimulate biomass growth. Grown algae can be harvested as superfoods, supplementing the protein intake from animal products, leading to more sustainability, sustainable food production and supply chains. The variables to be considered changing from the location's natural habitat and climate to choosing the specific algae species and providing it with the right conditions of appropriate solar radiations solar radiation, temperature, and pH. We continuously test the interaction with the environment as well as the application of digital and biotechnologies in the urban realm to evolve the methods and protocols of what we call collective urban cultivation. Responding to this realization, we are moving away from human-oriented framework of architecture to propose a new design science for the assemblage of human and non-human agents. Mediated by inhuman apparatuses. New research-based prototype include photosynthetic cyanobacteria cultures inoculated in a biogel medium. The, photosyn the system embodies multiple multi-generational long-term benefits of adopting a carbon absorbing technology into building facades. We have tested the system 
in two one-to-one -one scale pilots in Dublin and Helsinki, demonstrating the potential of building integrated algae-powered photosynthesis. An experimental practice allows us to embed the processes of experimentation into spatial context by engaging urban public spaces as open air laboratories. Experiencing these spaces stimulates us as humans to engage with urban spheric processes. We thus evolve our own sensibility and develop a renewed understanding of ourselves in relationship to our planet, to the planet we inhabit. Photosynthetic architectures operate as embedded algorithms, creating a biodigital conversation through which we acquire a non-human sensibility, a form of biointelligence allowing us to deal with planetary changes. By dissolving the human eyeness complex that still frames contemporary architecture, moving away from pure anthropogenic methodologies, that is to adapt a human-inhuman relationship towards a new epoch of shared biosphere. As humans, internal emotional state directly influences our behavior. The emotional um, evolution as a response to urban stimuli is one of the aspects of photosynthetic architecture that can evolve into a powerful mechanism of behavioral shift within the urban sphere. The biodigital conversation aims to unfold new layers of information towards understanding the complex informational network of behaviors. While creating this link, we not only engage in studying the other living organisms, but at the same time, we are sensing the self. The unconscious signals released by human body are an emotional reaction to in form of variety of psychological responses to any stimuli. However, we should take in consideration the influence not only of the environment itself, but even a disturbing thought that can be triggered by memory or our internal emotional well-being can, be, can influence the sensor data collection and therefore, as a consequence, the way we respond to urban environment. When we experience an arousing stimulus, like uh, an evocative question, a startling noise, or even a disturbing thought, our body generates a variety of psycho, uh, psychophysical responses. By man monitoring this phenomena uh, by biometric sensor technology, biofeedback, we can learn and train ourselves. We can grow our prefrontal cortex and improve our emotional state. This biodigital conversation aims to unfold new layers of information towards understanding the complex informational network of behaviors. The emotional evolution as a response to urban stimuli is one of the aspects of photosynthetic architecture that can evolve into powerful mechanism of behavioral shift within the urban sphere, involving us humans as co-actors. The system that function as an extended cognitive system that is conscious of its interconnectedness with uh, the environment creates a constant exchange with it, sourcing and feeding us back with information, matter and energy. The evolution of such biodigital system raises our awareness resulting in a biotechnological network of information. As uh, Benjamin Bratton says, our thinking and our interventions must be based on a higher resolution, understanding and cyclical interrelations and physical economies from scales of viral infections to intercontinental circulation and back again. While undergoing planetary changes of such enormous scales, such as climate change or COVID-19, we realize the impact of our planning over the urban sphere in large, is larger than we thought. Dealing with the large global territorial problematics and intercontinental biopolitics in projects such as Solana Open Aviary by Ecologic Studio, we explored the area through satellite Sentinel-2 in collaboration with European Space Agency via detailed scanning of biochemical processes on the ground and water, revealing the landscape habitats by scanning the earth through various bands beyond visual spectrum. Through transdisciplinary design, the project embraces the implication of its 
concept at all scales from the intercontinental to molecular. Sustainability is either of everything or it is nothing, quoting Tim Ingold. And so everything is interconnected in transcalar correlations that might be revealed only if explored through different set of lenses through unveiling a novel bioinformational landscape. When the linearity shifts into a convoluted set of feedback loops, circularity emerges as a fundamental paradigm and architectural experimentations shift from, carefully, from being a carefully designed spatial practice into a distributed set of dynamic processes unfolding in time. The notion of intelligence we recall here is rooted in collective behavior or decentralized self-organizing systems, natural or artificial, that continually learn from feedback, experience and even failure to produce just-in-time knowledge for better decisions that, this separate, that its separate elements acting alone could ever achieve. Using the potential of digital technology in the age of Anthropocene, we will start to explore and develop new biodigital landscapes. Applying digital computation as a tool for translation and communication of information, we are moving beyond comparing natural versus anthropogenic and examining dynamic forces of their metaphysical existence through digital computation. Looking at the landscape from satellite perspective, Translating an image into digital territory, we enrich our understanding of these territories through revealing the patterns of hidden information encoded in the landscape surface, such as wetness, fluorescence, or chlorophyll content presence densities within uh, large territories, such as uh, um, the map you are looking at uh, in London. Uh, I will finish uh, the presentation uh, with uh, uh, one of the questions that I used to frame my uh, current research. While most of urban mapping is driven by human-centric perspective, I would suggest asking the following question. How can we consciously evolve our behavior, shifting our perception of absolute spaces and therefore influence our impact on environment? Thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks a lot for the presentation. So we have the uh, conclusive presentation with um, Irini Tsumoku that will present how some of these aspects that apply in uh, practice, especially from the computational point of view. Uh, thank you, Irini. Uh, you can start. Thanks. Okay. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so in terms uh, of the city scale, Photosynthetica software developing an ecologic studio includes a package of algorithms and interfaces connected with embedded sensing and actuating mechanisms. It is able to record parameters from the microalgae culture medium and from the surrounding urban environment in real time and inform design choices, pattern of use and maintenance protocols. In other words, they effectively deploy the macroalgae metabolic power to transform the urban microclimatic and related local air quality. More urban tests are critical to gather data and accelerate the optimization protocol, thus increasing the efficiency of the technology. Since Photosynthetica is a living biodigital system, it can be trained and it will adapt in time to the specific site conditions, progressively improving its performance through use. This is an example of Rania Case project developed for UNTP. It is a simulated scenario for a regional distributed renewable energy network where microclimatic analysis was applied and its aim is to provide an advanced tool set to reprogram global cities for a safer and healthier post-pandemic world using biodesign strategies. With the integrated use of big data analysis and artificial intelligence, Deep Green can be deployed to assess urban vulnerabilities and find specific urban design and planning solutions to achieve immediate and long-lasting impact. For this process, advanced algorithm urban design technique have been used in order to, re, uh, to read large datasets from satellite, GIS, and digital elevation model sources. This application produced two kinds of outputs, hotspots maps of opportunities and simulated scenario modeling for long-lasting planning solutions. 
All this data analysis process can be processed and visualized in different softwares. Uh, VR provides the immersive experience and a better understanding of micro and uh, from micro to macro scale. This is a project produced in Innsbruck uh, University. So, as for the monitoring systems, the real-time monitoring system includes a series of sensors that can be installed independently to provide different levels of monitoring as we applied in the Biobombola project that you see in the slide. Uh, the core sensors are aquatic sensors and the environmental sensors. Aquatic monitoring algae growth uh, conditions inside the bioreactor are the sensors measure typically the four main factors affecting algal growth and the metabolism like salinity, pH, oxygenation, and temperature. Environmental sensors register microclimatic conditions around and outside the bioreactors. These are typically temperature, humidity, and light sensors. Their input is uh, to use the autom uh, automated key actuating device to moderate climatic extremes that can damage the culture. Photosynthetica adopts a big data approach to air pollution monitoring powered by a custom algorithm and dedicated to you. All of the below data are extracted and then reprocessed and visualized with scripting in a grasshopper interface. Urban pollutants data are collected via weather station of the specific city or project area developing for a project for a pharmaceutical company that is going to be placed in the next months, where it shows real-time air quality index the, these me the measurements are uh, then organized in a circular diagram with uh, 365 values that represents the days, deviated equally in the main circle and uh, five homocentric circular zones that represents the AQI levels. This protocol follows a two levels analysis approach. More specifically, the phase one is the, the daily uh, reading on GIS map, is, uh, uh, is a portable sensor measuring their quality at specific geographical uh, coordinates. It is accurate as it self-calibrates with cutting edge machine learning algorithms and its detection ranges between zero and 2000 parts uh, per billion or from zero to 200 micrograms. It calculates the urban pollutants of NO2, BOC, PM2.5, PM10, based on the local concentration that can detect it and shows real-time air quality index as well as real-time mapping of air quality. Uh, the, the second phase, uh, these data uh, are the exact uh, uh, numbers that are represented in, with geodata. The phase two is uh, the daily data reading on a circular plot diagram. And the phase three is the comparison um, based on the portable sensor air quality tracker with local weather station. The data are being compared on a single diagram. The weather station daily temperature that indicates the minimum and the maximum temperature of the day and the weather station daily average pollution are compared with uh, the personal tracker minute uh, by minute fluctuation and uh, the temperature of a living cultures. This help tracing correlations in time, predict trends, and understand the impact of the local microclimate. All these data were integrated to photosynthetic system, and uh, they're used to remetabolize pollution and affect design decision, as in the project that, uh, that uh, we worked with, with Ecologic Studio for Bioseri that was developed last year to show the coexistence of algorithmically grown and biologically grown colonies of uh, the Volvox algae. The collecting data from the above system can be used as the pre-process phase for a new computational design workflow that manages to generate training data sets of gun fissile. The more detailed and better resolution of the images of the first analysis, the more accurate results are generated by the algorithm. The algorithm is interpreting all the compressed information that each pixel includes uh, based on the materiality of the city and the morphological characteristics of the analysis. 
ultimately with the integrated use of remote sensing, big data analysis and artificial intelligence, Deep Green can be deployed to assess urban vulnerabilities and find specific urban design solutions to achieve immediate la and long lasting impact as well as was said before. While simulating the capacity of living system in the process of growing and becoming part of a new urban biodigital infrastructure, we are automatically called to reframe the nature of the city itself. This is taking place via machine learning algorithms that are used as an environmental tool that process and interprets the compressed information of the pixel to the urban area. Learning how to interpret large remote sensing data sets from the unique perspective granted by Ganfizarum enables a deeper inquiry into the contemporary significance of traditional planning concepts such as zones, boundaries, scale, typology, and program. The drained Ganfizarum is uh, deployed as an urban design technique to test the potential of microorganism growth intelligence in the computing scenarios of urban uh, uh, morphogenesis with non-human co conceptual framework. In uh, the project that is developing for Pompidou Museum with uh, inputs of the satellites of Paris and the center of Pompidou, while training our Ganfizarum algorithm, we transform the urban landscape of contemporary cities, recognizing invisible opportunities across scale, materials, and technolo technological regimes, thus inevitably expanding the city's repertoire of aesthetic qualities. The workflow includes uh, four main levels, input data reading, biotic abi and ab abiotic analysis, network analysis, and final scenario modeling. The GAN uh, FISARUM operates at level four. For the first analysis, advanced algorithm, ab Advanced algorithmic design techniques are used in order to read large datasets from satellite, GIS, and digital elevation model sources. Level two and three recognize and analyze the morphology of the city and the resource network. The analysis produces density map and path system for several urban systems, such as biomass, water collection, solar energy, that was referred to the deep green before. The cycle GAN algorithm belong uh, to the class of machine learning frameworks. They involve an automatic and supervised training uh, of image to image translation models without paired exams. In this case, the domain of the source images and target images refer to the slices of two actual input images that belong to two different domains, the urban and the biological. The first phase describes uh, the preparation of the images that are going to be used as inputs in the training, the data sets for the cycle are prepared via a processing script by slicing the images into small parts, the satellite image and the network pattern produced by the above algorithms. The tiles that are uh, used in uh, uh, the experiment are usually 400 uh, by 400 pixels. The second phase is the training of the cycle gun based on these input data sets. The model is trained to detect the morphology of the city network from the satellite and the morphology of the biological growth pattern of Isarum polycephalum, so it can project and translate the biological growth patterns to the actual city. The goal is uh, to learn the mapping between an input image and an output image using a training set of aligned slice pairs. During uh, the training, the algorithm runs 200 epochs and the visualization of uh, the evolution is illustrated in the browser window that can show how it self improves. So far, the models are uh, uh, sufficient for generating uh, plausible slices, slices and in the target domain, but are not uh, translations of the input slices. After we have trained the algorithm uh, with our data sets in the second phase, the algorithm passes to the third phase, testing, testing phase. During this phase, uh, the algorithm translates and creates the pattern into the satellite and the satellite to the pattern. Choosing the result from the new satellite, we continue to the fourth phase. The fourth phase refers uh, to the combination of the result slices using another processing script and sending us data, the result slices, the final image is recreated. In this case, the output image is uh, 4,000 by 4,000 pixels. Uh, the created uh, network is mapped to the initial satellite image, producing a future view of the integration of the city into the landscape and opposite back to based on the research data resulted by need of uh, distribution of the networks. Thank you. 
Thank you, Irini. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thanks a lot. Detail on, on, on the presentation and the project. Um, now we will leave the words to Xiao Wang. That I would suggest to start with two questions from Xiao that we can all answer, and then maybe we can open to question to the public or from the guests and the audience if it works from all. Thank you, Xiao. To you. Hey. So hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Oh, good, yes. Okay, and it is a great honor for me to moderate today's panel discussion and thanks all of the presenters for giving us such amazing presentation. And I think all of the projects are very remarkable. So here I would like to start the first question with our ter um, Theresia. So um, when talking about the photosynthetic architecture or eco-friendly building, we may probably make association with the technical aspect. For example, what is the operating principles or how to increase the production efficiency, especially in specific projects, the concept of the ecology sometimes fades away behind a strong impression of technology, since all of the design projects you present here are ecological. Apart from technology, how do you recognize the concept of eco um, ecology in the design um, terms? So, Theresia? Thank you, Xiao. Uh, thank you for the great question. I uh, really believe that uh, all the photosynthetic architecture, they work parallel between uh, human in human uh, biodigital design, but also including technology. But as understanding or trying to frame uh, what is the role of ecology in these uh, projects, I believe we also need to redefine a little bit the conventional definition of ecology and the sustainability. As sustainability has been, I think, for too long uh, um, understood as preservation. But if our world is fundamentally given in movement and is driven by dynamic forces, uh, ecology, I believe, cannot be understood as maintaining uh, some sort of steady state, but rather be um, understood as a dynamic. So if, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, the world is dynamic, then the ecology or the sustainability and, and, and something that we now perceive as preservation might actually mean change. And therefore, I believe it's essential for us to detach from preserving objects in their state, finding this kind of optimal version of, of, of nature or of our environment. But uh, uh, we need to realize and ourselves maybe also come in peace with our own fears of change, decay, decomposition, even mortality, embrace uh, these elements and uh, therefore redefine our understanding of ecology. I hope I answered your question. I will give a word also to other, other speakers because I think this is a question that uh, come across all our disciplines and all our presentations. Yes, thanks for your answer. I think it's very good. So uh, the end one, have any other comments on that? Okay. If not, um, I would also like to add some points um, because for me, what impressed me a lot is not only the project uh, which shows the frequent, um, I mean, ecology or the energy and material exchange between the biosphere and the urban sphere, but also I think all of the projects just integrate non-human to deal with the information, interaction and the feedback loops. I think uh, the realization of the existence of information could be seen as a leap because it is something more than energy and material. So out of the ecology, we have the information and the collection, the procession and reaction towards such kind of information embodied what we call intelligence. So uh, this project here displayed multiple forms of bio, uh, biodigital intelligence. We see the synthetic landscape seems to react to the external stimulus and reach stable, but dynamic um, balance and then the photosynthetic system establish a human to non-human communication to improve the urban metabolism and the GAN Fisaron computes novel morphologies and show a brand new vision of city based on alien cognition. 
a multiple sensory system applied in Deep Green project collects data and sets up the recursive feedback loops with the urban environment, which is mechanic. So here we can start with the second question, and this is open for everyone to discuss. As we all know, the definition of intelligence is controversial and usually related to consciousness, cognition, and so on. But in the, the intelligent agents are not limited to human and animals. So considering the intelligent performance, which is showed in this project, I want to ask, how do we understand these non-traditional intelligent agents, which renew the meaning of cognition? And what is their contribution to the architectural field? So here, uh, I would like to invite our Irene to say something first. Yeah, uh, so the definition of intelligence is a uh, controversial and uh, I'm, uh, usually related to consciousness cognition. Um, with the development of uh, cognitive uh, science and computational neuroscience, cognitive uh, and delta agents uh, uh, are not uh, limited to human and animals anymore. Leading uh, uh, the AI textbooks def uh, define the intelligent agent as any device that uh, perceives its environment and takes actions that uh, maximize uh, its chance of successfully achieving its uh, goals, um, which uh, directly points to technological equipment such as the computer. Uh, the research on non-conscious cognition even indicates uh, that uh, cognition could exist uh, uh, in not only an individual participant like a machine, but also a system enlarging the spectrum of uh, cognitive uh, agents in further. Yeah, this is my part, so... Yeah, maybe I just add on that. I don't know, I, I, I really like um, uh, the works of Gregor Batenson. And I think that when we are thinking about intelligence, of course, we every, like every time first we think about our own cognition, about the uh, human. No? And I like how Gregor Batenson defines, um, like in his steps to ecology of mind, no? he uh, defines us and defines our cognition as a distributed system, which is fully embedded into the relation with our environment that we belong to. And I think here we are starting to talk about this, uh, about the different agencies within the cognition. Now, when we are starting to pr probably differently define a human himself, you know, that we are every time, like if we just remove this understanding that cognition belongs to human and start to think that uh, our mind is shared and spread into the environment into the relation with the ecosystem we belong, in the, the relation with the information, with the technologies which are surrounding us. We basically, uh, yeah, absolutely spread around. And then we are starting to understand, okay, that cognition is not only belong to our brain. The cognition is basically embedded maybe into the system that we belong to. And here comes all this non-anthropocentric vision, non-anthropocentric understanding of that. And uh, which role takes here non-human intelligency, uh, well, the perfect role, the hundred percent role, they are basically playing with us, the system of our cognition. And I think that now, like we also in the presentation, I was defining different forms of intelligence, which are embedded in the landscape in our sense, because in the lab, we are focused more on the exploration of the landscape itself now, and we are looking how we are kind of reading it now. But, um, yeah, no, but I think that uh, the first question goes to the uh, to the human. And if you're talking about intelligence, for me, I think the answer is that the intelligence and it's distributed. It's distributed in different forms, and all these forms are uh, like a, for me <laughs> the intelligence we're talking about. Probably that would be the answer. A bit like uh, for the spider, right? Um, the spider web constitute an extension of its uh, cognitive system. And uh, recently in a project we were doing, we were challenged by part of the client team to define how do we test architecture, the ecological efficiencies and intelligence of architecture. We can't test it in the lab and it's not a univocal answer. Uh, so it is not something to which we can give uh, 
the answer from within a problem solving uh, framework. In this sense, I wonder what uh, Philip and uh, Rachel would have to add uh, in relationship to their experience with uh, architecture that uh, in a way uh, it's alive with living architecture, Rachel, and with uh, a sensitive architecture, I would say, uh, Philip Beasley. Who's the first one? Go ahead, Rachel, please. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> Uh, no, I was I was going to say, I was just um, thinking of uh, Philip's um, Hylozoic ground and the subsequent series from that in terms of um, you know when uh, Maria was talking about and, and uh, distributed forms of intelligence um, and I think there's a lot to do with where you place the focus of your attention um, because uh, you know if I think through Karen Barad for example and the new materialist discourses that empower uh, not just the non-human, but matter um, as a co-constitutor of design of space, of experience, um, then I think that our recognition of what this concept of intelligence is, is uh, deeply challenged. I don't think there's a simple answer to that. So if we're thinking through Barad, you know, we're actually thinking about molecules um, negotiating, you know, electrons and charges and fields. Um, and the fact that that is lively and dynamic, I mean, that's the stuff that we're made of. And so I guess if we don't attribute a kind of uh, form of, um, uh, not necessarily sentience, but a kind of an agency, uh, a relatable agency, we, I don't see how we can actually come to the conclusion <laughs> that we possess anything worth talking about. Um, so, I mean, I think there are many, many different scales of this. And I think that historically uh, people have uh, wanted a mirror um, and, you know, through our own uh, notions of self-awareness, we've got rather pleased <laughs> about how we're doing uh, in thinking. Um, and I think we've paid a lot less, we've, we've been rather, uh, yeah, vain uh, about what we expect intelligence to be, or what, it is, what is it that we value that we're calling intelligence, I think. I mean, I think sometimes that some of these terminologies, because they have historic definitions, become wildly problematic, because then when you try to express what it is that interests you, what's, what's captivating me about a moving landscape that seems to respond to uh, weather and people and organisms what, what's what's you know what's important about that why why is that a great subject for design why is it something that as a person you know I have a I have an interest in and and um, so so I think there's a whole value system that frames even the definitions that we're using about where our attentions focus that I think is really being raised by uh, the project work that that, that I've um, you know just been uh, you know uh, looking at, and I must say, Philip, inter interrupt because I, I don't want to go on forever because I could. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's but I, but I, but I think what I think for, for me, I, I'll just close with this. What I what I think I've seen, um, and I'm really excited about this, is a monstering right, of, of, of different forms of dynamism. And I love your um, a kind of integration. For me, they're monstrous landscapes in the sense of arts for living on a damaged planet and the work that Anna Singh and her colleagues um, uh, put together. You know, she, they, they, you know, when you read the book one way, it's about ghosts. And when you read it the other way, it's about monsters. And for me, this is, you know, these are kind of fabulous, fabulous monsters. Um, of the Anthropocene, you know, those, those kind of hybrids that won't conform um, and um, are going to breed anyway, whether this is something that design gets, um, you know, hold of anyway, because they are manifest somehow in our world. So I, I want to really uh, praise the work because I think it's very evocative and you've, uh, you know, really created some, you know, fantastic foundations for uh, kind of design inspiration for thinking about what cities and what life is. So thank you. I don't know if, if Philip wants to jump in. 
I, Rachel has already said some very provocative things, so I'd, I'd welcome reaction to that, and and then then maybe I can I can comment to follow. Well, what I'm wondering on 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 Rachel's discourse is also because I feel maybe we share some common ground here with Philip, Rachel, and the other researchers that are present, but. Uh, often when we talk about intelligence in architecture, we mean something else. And they often refer to the application of a specific, you know, technology or, 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 or device. Still, as Xiao actually was pointing out in the 53 question, the same happened with ecology. And that's why we try to pair the two questions and understand how we could overcome this paradigm. And although we might share uh, some of the answer here, it will be important to understand how do we um, somehow actualize this answer further. And we present an architecture that overcome a technological, purely technological response to what is intelligent, to what is ecology, but to give a spatial, more complex response to this question, which is, I think, is, in my opinion, or for what is the agenda that I'm interested in, a priority to tackle also some of the crises we are in or to re-describe them or, or, or think them through different alternative solution, which the pure technology in itself, you know, cannot give. So how do we uh, discuss and promote or make clear the fact that this technology, although great in itself, can't answer the question, but architecture could contribute to reframe the answer in, in in some way, to some extent. So, yeah. Can I chip in there, uh, Claudia? First of all, it was extraordinary work. I mean, really amazing to see, fantastic work going on. You know, I think, you know, you could take it, I, I just to follow up on what you're saying, you could take from a kind of very kind of puritanical, let's say, technological line or a puritanical AI line or a puritanical neuroscience line, or whatever, and you could criticize the work. You could say, oh, it doesn't do this. But, you know, I think in a way, what I saw today was something that, um, it kind of it positioned itself in a way not dissimilar to, the, to how I see MIT Media Lab operating. In other words, is it technological or is it design? You know, it's kind of both, you know, and I think that, that, that you know, we have to be more, much more dialectical in the, how we approach things as architects. And I think what I found very interesting was the role of, 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 of the aesthetic in this, in this project. You know, it, it was really incredibly powerful. And I think that, you know, that's the point. We tend to sort of, to, from Gadolf Lewis onwards, we tend to sort of think, well, okay, there's there's, there's design and there's, there's there's things that function, but design also functions, and I think that's an important part of, the, of what this work is all about. And I, I think it, you know you can't be strictly technological about it. And just to go and pick up on what Rachel was saying about about the mirror, I think in many ways it is a mirror, but in some ways the mirror I was thinking of was the mirror in Alice in Wonderland. You kind of step through this mirror into this incredible kind of kingdom, which is full of provocations and things, and uh, it's it is a, it's to my mind it's a primarily a design project but an, an exquisite one and i think it really has a role of of consciousness raising and all sorts of other issues and it cannot be cannot be reduced simply to the technological at all that would be my view i wa i wonder if i could pick up on on that neil and and perhaps build on on a comment that 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 brielle fir first asked and and, Ra and rachel directly commented on that that is this this thorny thorny divide between nature and technology or perhaps between the sense of sheer health and intelligence and inspiration and the risk of fascism uh, that and, and in intervention and 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 harm through through artifice what an extraordinarily precarious divide and yes, we can absolutely have have uh, confidence in the kind of monstering um, that that Rachel you you, you invoked. I, I agree. I mean, if if we think of of our elder muse Donna Haraway's encouragement to to say that we don't fear the divide between nature and technology, rather we see it as a kind of glorious glossolalia of 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 just with it, we swarm with fertility. Then, then we could see the work that we've seen today as being an extraordinary contribution. I mean, and I, I, I do think in its first order, it's I, I just have, absolutely have to commend the work, and I'm thrilled by by seeing what's what's shown here. I also have a deep ambivalence and a fear of it as well. But but to speak first of of, of the joy I feel, I feel that you are in this practical, methodical design work that is introduced and brought into the space of design. It's being made available 
to architects. I think that you're introducing a fundamental decolonized topology, which is different than the world of reductive platonic work. That is to say, the, the inference that we need to make something bounded and clear and make good walls between things and clarify things as much as possible as the reward structure of design. Instead, I think that we have see the whole festival of dissipative forms set out in, in this work. The, the class that Prigogine taught us about 60 years ago in which things are deeply interwoven and, and, they, and they develop through the sheer kind of involvement through the world that, 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 that we know is a part of nature. So this is an incredibly important lesson and an and example, the topologies that you've offered. I think you've also set up the possibility of empathy. That is that we are not separate from an animal or from a tool or from a rock. They are in our bodies, we interject them, the intel their intelligence is ours. And th these two things together, the empathy, the mechanical empathy structures and the dissipative form language are two extraordinarily important contributions that I, I feel that you are offering. However, I think that you're introducing some extraordinary risk as well. And my, my, my sort of anxious blunt question is, what are the convolutional networks that you have, have, have introduced doing for the health and the extraordinary fertility of say, the planet paradise of, of Paris, sorry, <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice Freudian, um, of, Par of Paris that, that, that is being operated on. Uh, Claudia, when you showed the first images of Gan Fizerum in your images and, 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 they, and they continued in, 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 in some of the later presentations, I saw some extraordinarily joyful material but I also saw the most aggressive cancer-like consumption of the surrounding fabric, selfishly annihilating existing fabric, converting it into, some, into something new. The, the boundary be, be, between the, the invasive spe species and, and the existing was a, was a place of cruelty and death as, as well as conversion. And I also saw the introduction of a new extraordinary exotic manifold in, 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 the, in, the, in the new reticulum that it was really replaced by, but I also saw the risk of homogeneity, eutrophy, anoxia, the kind of conditions that in the natural world speak of a new kind of death through a premature equilibrium. And it's the equilibrium that comes from working with a closed system that is to say, we have amazing growth. It saturates every single place and then it comes to a new place and then, then it's stuck in, in the negative phase of a swamp. Now that's not a, not a, not a positive state. That's, that, that, that's a, a deeply dangerous state. And does that mean that in fact, the kind of cutting and boundaries and annihilation that, that, that I'm complaining about at, 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 in, you know, in the reward structure that I think that you've introduced into your GANs, into, in, into, in, into the current operations, is actually part of what you're proposing? In other words, are, are you in fact introducing some deeply, deeply difficult ethics, even eugenics, into the work? Can we take responsibility, therefore, for this new, extraordinarily fertile world? And how do we work with, with the consequence? Are we contributing something in the convolution? Or actually, is it introducing new kinds of suffering as well? Now, please don't let me flatten the discussion into ethics. I think it's a, it needs to be a, a joyful, ironic question. But I hope that I hope this, this ambivalence op offers something. Uh, to this. Death is part of life and that we need to acknowledge, otherwise we can't design, right? Um, on the other end, what we are interested in exploring, and there are different level of projects, some um, uh, that are part of the UN program and then look at ethics on a certain level, and other that are part of conversation with the Center for Pompidou that look at aesthetic value on another level. So it's true, depending from the project, maybe the ethical or aesthetic value are pushed more or less, that is true. But what is common in this time of exploration is looking at pattern and aesthetic as an ecological value that acquire different level of actualization. 
during the project and goes through transformation that imply that. Uh, to which extent is a question that need to be understood through behavioral observation. But uh, what is interesting for us in this exploration is really the pattern, how the setting become an indicator for us. And it's an indicator of ecological system that can be mapped, a pixel is an information, the satellite that we, images that we saw in many of the project are information in itself. In the slime mold, the morphology of the slime mold, it's a measure of its efficiency. So it's interwoven. It, it, it's got a beauty, but it's also part of its behavior. You can't depict one from the other. You cannot, you know, engineer the behavior without looking at the, the aesthetic quality. So um, it's impossible to depict. And uh, this element that we work with and, and some of the elements we have been always working with are uh, part of what in other concepts we had, and other people is also defined, you know, the, the, the idea of dark ecology. So cyanobacteria are effectively a pollutant themselves, you know, algae blooming, it's a uh, issue many ecologists dealing with, but uh, they have other qualities. So it's always a balance between, as you said, it's a balance. And it's a balance uh, that you, through, I guess, experimentation and, and, and development of methods, you need to um, work with and deal with and accept. And maybe the most difficult things is to make your client accepting this. Uh, one of the most difficult things because they are, um, we are used to reassurance. Things need to work. Uh, what it means working for a city? How does a city work? Uh, you know, it, it will not work. It will interact, it will evolve, it will grow, they grow, die and, and live again. So these are the systems that we try to map and you know, the data are, are precise, but then there needs to be a speculative level in which this pattern become indication and also something else. Okay, thank you can so much. To, can I respond to Philip? Yes, of course, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> Um, because, because I was, yeah. I, I think uh, this is this is really interesting. Because I think, based on aesthetics alone, you cannot say that this is metastatic and related to death. Um, because, so the question for me is, what are the indicators? What because there are some very ugly things in nature that are just okay. <laughs> They're fine, thank you very much. Um, so ugly and <laughs> Ugly, is still an ugly. I'm saying it's it's effusive and it's and it's it's having a great time. But the thing that I'm interested in. So what are the in, if in some ways beyond the aesthetics? What are the indicators? What are the conversations? What are the tactics? What are the relations that you're setting in motion so that we can read and respond with these proposals and structures so that we do know if things are OK? And then, you know, should we be doing something about that? That's kind of like the social, relational, ecological dimensions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely excited by the work and I, I don't have the same obsession with aesthetics. <laughs> I'm quite happy with the, with the rather odd and... and uh, peculiar. I guess the presentation of Irini was underlining that, no? In the project of Photosynthetica, we map uh, NOx, uh, CO2, PM2.5, PM10. These are some of the parameters that everybody calls pollutant. I call them just elements that are present in a uh, disrupted metabolic air. Uh, but uh, these are some of the parameters and the pattern that we map. And also that way they also the presentation were, were distributed was to show this different uh, angle. Uh, some show the aesthetic value and the pattern, some show the effective parameter that have been mapped both at the territorial scale, like in the deep green, uh, green corridor and water flow, as well as the waste management, or at the microscopic level of the prototype, you know, when we map directly three levels, one level are the element present in the air, the other level are the element present in the microalgae, so pH, uh, temperature, and the other are the one that um, Teresa is investigating in her PhD, so our biometric response to this. So these are three of the parameter we map to understand how do we correlate. But the correlation doesn't happen on the single number. Of course, 
we don't want to kill logic in itself. <laughs> it's a relationship between logic and metalogic, although a bit in a Machiavellic manner, I tend to push always the metalogic aspect. But uh, of course, it's a conversation between logic and metalogic. And uh, this parameter value that you can evaluate punctually and in a very positivistic and rational and efficient manner, but they also have pattern that you can't evaluate so directly and you need to rely on some level of reading of the pattern and the setting of the bubbler that in terms of machine learning, it's an information, in terms of algae is an information, in terms of slime mold, it's an information. So I see correlation between how this number work functionally on a punctual level, but also how their pattern goes beyond that functionality in itself. If I can just jump in in this point, because there are so many comments that I even I think I forgot the part of the uh, comments I wanted to say, but I think what we are trying to do is to basically stop maybe lying ourselves and dividing the technology and the natural science between themselves. Because basically what we are doing now, we are looking to the city and the uh, kind of landscape as a two separate things. No? But what we are saying that, okay, we erode and terraform our landscape with the technology. Okay, we do that. Yes, we, we assume. And of course, um, that's, that's a question and there is a, uh, a list of ethical questions happening. But I think that what we are trying to do, we are trying to resolve these ethical questions with aesthetics. And aesthetics, I think, is a way how to make technology ecological, how to communicate a new technology through the this kind of aesthetical vision to, to people, not to the socium. That what we are trying to find a new language uh, to merge these two separate realms together. And uh, I think that that's the, that's the answer. And I, that could be, of course, that, that brings a lot of questions, uh, ethical questions. But uh, yeah, that, that's, like, I think that what we are trying to do is basically to give an answer to that. And that's the, also related to the question of uh, uh, Rachel that she was saying that, okay, what is the, uh, basically the role of the designer here? Or like, why do we are so excited about this uh, question? Oh, why, what is the role of the aesthetics here? And I think that now we are like, like I'm questioning myself, why do we use these computational tools? Why do we use these different types of cognition or AI uh, to design? Oh, because probably when we are now thinking about the designing and we understand that we are not designing for ourselves anymore, or like we are not placing ourselves in the center of the design question. Now we are starting to think that probably our uh, human tools and human uh, set of the rules of, that we're using for design uh, is not uh, relevant anymore. And we are trying maybe to find some different types of cognition, some different type of, uh, uh, I don't know, ways of designing, which helps us to extract some intelligence in from the other parts. And that's why we are lo you, like looking to the biology and trying to extract the patterns. That's why we are looking to the algorithms and trying to understand how the algorithm could take a certain part certain role in the design process. And still, like coming back to the uh, question of Axial, of course there is a uh, human there as well, no? And how does all this create this designing which is not anthropocentric? I think that's, that's the answer and the aesthetic here takes uh, a huge role as well. Yeah, maybe I could just chip in something there. Uh, um, uh, Rachel, I, my, I had my grandparents lived in Worthing in Sussex, right? And you probably know Worthing. Um, and my grandmother had a Parker Knoll chair. I mean, it was ugly as hell, but very comfortable. You know, and if I contrast a Parker Knoll chair with a Zaha sofa, actually from a kind of strictly kind of comfort level, probably the Parker Knoll chair, which is really ugly, is probably more comfortable than the Zaha chair. But there's something about that, the Zaha chair in the kind of the, the way we, the, the role of, of design in it, which which actually creates a sense of empathy that actually that, that, that uh, Philip was, was talking about. To my mind, there is a kind of a role there. And that's what I see in this work, this really highly refined um, work. You can't judge it just in technology alone. You've got to see it through the lens of this um, exquisite, ex and it really is exquisite, um, uh, kind of aesthetic sensibility. That would be my view. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Hey, Helen, so, uh, is, is it okay if I if I just just pick up on that even more, um, Maria? I I think that that what you've said in in offering this as being a fun, fundamental aesthetic realm um, is is a really I, I think you've put your finger on something very important to my mind, and and per, per, perhaps that that extends Neil's earlier comment about about this this move moving this work in into a, a, a design design space. To, to me, if I look at this, I, I describe the space in, be, in between the, 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 the new invasions and the existing fabric of Paris, Paris as being a, dr a dreadful, frightening thing. And, and Rachel spoke of it as, as, mon as lovely monstering. And I, perhaps I flattened the discussion much too quickly by speaking about death. Claudia, you, 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 re you responded rather passionately and, and, I, and I take your word on, on that to, to lift this just a little because the polarizing effect of using extremely rigid bi binary ethics is, is, is precisely the problem. Um, if we can sit in the space of hallucination and dream and, po and possibility creation, then what an extraordinarily important part of the, of the process of abiogenesis, uh, that, that is of the transition into living systems, which, which we might, might consider this work to be, to be fundamentally about. That brings me back to a speculation that, that, that Rachel made about Karen Barad's work. Uh, and, 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 and perhaps we could take, take Barad's writing as, as being a, a great framing of what we're seeing here in the sense that Barad would propose intra-action rather than interaction. And by, by that, I believe that she, that she means that rather than interaction meaning inter like thing, things that are between the walls bouncing between be between bouncing in empty space like billiard balls as if you have yes you have definite agents but the space is always somehow empty and what you really care about is just the transaction between another thing instead she sees the milieu itself always within being the thing that bodies you forth in into the interaction. In other words, you are you are creating your milieu as you work in in in, in moving yourself. You're always culpable. You are you are creating. You, you are the field and the ground simul simultaneously, and and this this kind of de delicious sense I think could could be very very much anchored by looking at the language of aesthetics and rhetoric too. And I wonder whether, whether we could think about developing reward structures for the determinants, the indicators of health, let's say, or, or hilarity or inspiration or, or the sheer language of beauty by looking rather closely at that language and trying to develop it more as reward structures for the convolutional networks and, for, and the GANs that you are working with. This, this reminds me of, of Carolyn Van Eck's wonderful work, the philosopher of, of architecture, she, uh, who, who, who's written in particular on 19th century architecture and on the industrial revolution, you know, very relevant to the monstering that I heard Rachel speak about. And Van Eck speaks about Renaissance terms like conchinitas, the word that Neil, Neil has, has, has given to us through, through Alberti, the, the, the sense of whole bodied kind of lively health that comes from contrapposto, comes from diversity, but fundamentally making a whole. She also talks about, about other rhetorical structures such as irony and, and not, in other words, not simply just making something elegant and clear and cutting and winning, but also how can we make something lively and amusing and the revelations of something where something folds back on itself and inverts itself as well. As well. And so it makes me think that, that, that those languages might be a, a very important terrain as a, as a kind of reward structure for this work. Yeah, maybe if I just one thing, I, I, I think, you know, within this, I don't want to talk about aesthetics the whole time, but, you know, you think about the 19th century, there was the picturesque and there was the sublime, right? And, and, and that is itself part of that. So, you know, I'm thinking about some of the things that appeared in the Sensation Exhibition years ago that were kind of, 
ugly in the kind of way, but still part of an aesthetic project. And I was, in some ways, when you think about it in terms of poetics or something, I was reminded of this, I don't know if you know this, this um, the Duino Elegy by, by Rilke, second Duino Elegy, it starts off, Jede Engel ist schrecklich. Every angel is terrifying. And I think that is the kind of a way to subvert that and, and incorporate that within this whole project. I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't think it's, it's, there's nothing terrifying too much about this in a way, but it is, it is exquisitely beautiful. I, anyway, I, I'll keep quiet now, but uh, I, I really, I just, I just was blown away by this, what I saw today. This, Actually, the reference to the, the 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 sort of first industrial revolution and the the, the reference to the grandma O'Neill made me think that some of the elements that we are discussing here today maybe are due also to my grandma then, uh, because I, ca I come from a totally different experience there of a sort of uh, rural context uh, uh, south of Turin uh, where production had a certain efficiency but uh, also a certain ritual, which will entail pleasure, being visual or others, uh, as part of his evaluation system. And uh, that could not be separated from there. You know, the, the fair, the religion, the, 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 the atmosphere, the rituals of, of cultivation, uh, that were related also to celebration uh, and to the aesthetic of a specific uh, agricultural context or rural context were interwoven with this productivity. There would be no productivity without these rituals. Uh, I couldn't imagine them differently in this pre-industrial context. Of course, technique were very simple and not technological, but I wonder whether true the type of technology that we can access today, we can overcome uh, this uh, segregation in, induced uh, uh, probably in England much earlier than in Italy. That's why I witnessed that probably nobody in the context of UK or witnessed that at my age because that was, was not here anymore, the type of relationship, um, if it's ever, ever been, I'm not sure. But um, then can we reintroduce this relational system, whereas uh, we don't evaluate uh, through pure optimization of one single parameter. We have an awareness of what you know uh, optimization is, but we have this uh, what Philip was saying: this intra sort of ecology or intra evaluation system that is more complex than that. And we need to integrate other parameter beyond the uh, purely logical one to be able to, to evolve the design and, and, and carry forward, which don't need to be the only one, because again, I agree with Rachel, because if you don't have the logical parameter as well, then maybe it gets a little bit too metaphysical, but uh, you know, it's a balance that we need to, to, to try and understand how to strike and also discuss. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for discussing that. So I'm so happy to see that um, when we see the Genf and Fisarum image of the city, when we see it subvert our previous memory of the city with zoning, with boundary scale, and so on. And I think that's why we are so excited about this topic. And I also learned a lot from your explanation on the deep meaning of such a surprising image and, uh, and your explanation on the significance of these patterns and this visual language and the aesthetics behind that. I think it is a very good, nice discussion. And uh, uh, here now we have the question from Mariana in the chat room. So she mentioned about uh, the GAN, the GAN Fersorum image. The first question is that, um, how do you think that the GAN could evolve in terms of being able to achieve lower energy consumption to train the networks because all of the images we use are processed in farms, for example, in Google, collaborative that use large amounts of energy during the process. So what is your vision in this regard? I think probably our Irene could answer this question. Yes, uh, yeah, it's a nice question. I... In, uh, in the project that uh, I showed, we are using, uh, we're not using uh, Google Collab, uh, we are using, uh, we're running all the tests uh, with NVIDIA GeForce GPU. And actually what is the difference is uh, the pre-process of this data. Actually, we don't use uh, um, pair examples from, uh, a, uh, from a, a high number of images, but one image um, split it in tiles. This is what uh, 
uh, give us more um, uh, resolution and better analysis in order to reach to uh, the compressed information of each uh, pixel. So uh, with this situation, we don't need uh, to train, for example, uh, different uh, uh, images at the same time, but uh, we can focus in one that we, we care. We can split it uh, in tiles uh, with uh, a, a small resolution and when uh, we combine them back, they can give us an, a, good, uh, a, a good output that can uh, uh, contain some of the information we want. Also, uh, the way that we are using Anfizarum, uh, uh, it contains the information loop, let's say, that interacts uh, based on how we set up the experiment and uh, what is the information that it's giving us. For example, in the case, in the case of uh, Paris, we created uh, many experiments with um, a slime mold in the office and uh, uh, having uh, extracting first uh, the information uh, um, from the city map based on a grid, based on, uh, uh, on the green areas analysis. Uh, and also then we created this grid uh, uh, in a Canva where uh, we distributed uh, proportionally the food for the slime mold. And then uh, um, focusing on the starting and the end point, ending points, we saw this uh, growth um, evolution. And uh, by capturing them, then we try to, to simulate this uh, and uh, exchange the information uh, uh, with the materiality of the city and uh, this uh, morphological pattern. Yeah, uh, and one aspect of this is also that using uh, biological simulation is part of this conversation, how you uh, shift uh, from uh, a system of computation that is uh, fast uh, high resolution in data, but uh, extremely energy consuming for the infrastructure that sustain it. It's one way, right? We use uh, algorithm to uh, understand the urban sphere, to understand ecological pattern that otherwise we wouldn't see and would not understand. So we would not be even aware of ecological crisis. On the other end, these algorithm and data are one way in terms of energy. They take energy in never give it back, right? So it's a system that goes one direction. And that's one of the interests in or working and pairing with the biological computation is trying to understand how uh, computation can be more embedded in material and could somehow self-sustain itself, uh, as in the case of the Fisarium polystephano. Of course, uh, then alone, when you need to apply it at the moment, that would not be enough to be applicable uh, uh, at the scale of the city and still needs the support of the infrastructure. On the other end, I'm not for a, what I call anorexic ecology. I'm not for saving uh, energy in itself on every act I do, but I'm more from trying to understand how we restructure the system so that the system create more energy loops. Energy goes out and comes back. So eventually also the computational system, the server system will need to be part of this idea of redesigning the infrastructure, integrate maybe biological element into it and uh, um, that feed themselves and uh, therefore uh, rebalance the current, uh, the current uh, level of energy consumption of, of, of the system, I believe. Yeah, maybe yeah. talking. Yeah, Maria, yeah. please. Sorry. Yeah, maybe talking about another project that I was very briefly mentioning about the Fizarum, this is the Fizarum game. I think that I every time imagine this game as something more analog, you know, where we actually have a Fizarum as a like as a method recomputing the city, but in the physical way, you know, not actually using the computational methods, maybe even like that. And well, but this question is, yeah, now uh, very hot. No, also Memo uh, recently posted very interesting uh, calculations about the unre unreasonable ecological cost of the crypto art, which is super relevant, I understand. But I don't know, I think that we, uh, in general, we move to this idea of the biocomputation of the biocomputers, which are starting to use uh, biological methods, the DNA, DNA informational storages as a way of computing. And basically we're coming from the digits back to the analogs, now using the analog method of, com of computation. And I think that's probably the next step which would uh, answer this question. And uh, there are several um, 
scientists who are working on that, we were in contact with Andrew Damaski, who is very much keen on that. And there is a list of other people who are uh, looking towards the direction. And yeah, I think that the, that's probably in next. We have never been digital. I would say. <laughs> we need to come back to analog. <laughs> Yeah, can I just uh, maybe because actually Marina and uh, Claudia have a kind of connection through Cyril Natalie, who will be here in three weeks' time. And Cyril, I, I was he was teaching at the AA, fantastically subtle thinker. Now he's the dean at Detella, but he was interested. Or he was always working with with um, <clears throat> with engineers, with um, structural engineers, Hanif Kara, and you could take him and think it was he was obsessed by optimization, by structural performance. And, and I once asked him, and, and he said, No, no, no. I, I, I really don't not interested in this at all. I'm trying to destroy this. I'm not at all interested in this. And I think it's kind of like in a way there's a sort of subtlety behind this sort of work where it cannot be never be re reduced just to these kind of questions at all. So uh, uh, maybe that's a way of, of, of um, addressing Marina's question. But um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your answer. And I think just now, Claudia and Mario's answer have partly responded to uh, Mariana's another question, uh, which is, uh, what is the, uh, which is, the, uh, what do you think of the, uh, the bills of data? And can the bills of data to be a new kind of pollution? So do you have anything to, I mean, to add up to that or anything to comment on that? So Okay, if not, then we can just uh, jump back to the uh, question that I give here. So um, thank you for the discussion on that. But I think just now we have already discussed about the role of the designer uh, when we are dealing with the non-human intelligence. So here, uh, what I want to say is uh, uh, whether uh, when we, we understand that there's a shift of the non-human role in the bio design, um, for example, just like the machines, they are not just seen as a kind of tool for just just to transform the information from our brain to the screen. And also, um, and I think the living organism, they are not just uh, uh, merely the components in the green technology and just to solve the problems caused by human. So uh, here I have another question. So how do you see the image of men inside that bio design? So is there any, any kind of change on that? Um, for this question, so I, I think this question could be open to uh, for the human yeah. exchange. The human is spread. There's a the human is dissolved within yeah. the concept of the nature of the environment, and I think that's a cool way to think about ourselves. Like just really imagining ourselves is uh, as Rachel was saying as a cyborg. But saying cyborg yeah. is not just saying that uh, ourself is ourself, but we have a plugged and an electronic device here and it helps me to think or to i don't know produce something no to feel yourself as this kind of suborgian uh, agent is basically to basically to think ourselves as a uh, some kind of i don't know item distributed with the surrounding like uh, um if we think about our body now we every time uh, look ourselves that this is like that I'm finishing here. That's my my skin, and that's how I consist. That's myself. But basically, if you really just without any imagination, you understand who I am. No, my temperature exchange doesn't finish here. My temperature exchange spread probably I don't know at least in the fifty centimeters around myself. My uh, voice spread around. My atoms are and particles are my breathing. I have a direct exchange with the environment just physically. If you think to the digital information, now we are just fully augmented uh, with everything around. And if we come back to our discussion about the cognition and we think actually what is our mind and what is our, like, uh, yeah, what is our cognition, we really understand that it's not only us who think, it's the environment and the um, ecosystem around us uh, who thinks no and uh, yeah and I think that's that's the answer and about the human and about the role of the man uh, or woman <laughs> I like to divide that in that no so uh, yeah it's just the, it's a change of the role of ourselves and the change yeah and from here is coming the change the way how do we design yeah so thank you uh, so um, let's yeah, come to one, uh, one comment on Mariana um, 
uh, question on, on the abuse of data, I think that is totally possible, but also I think that is, uh, that is where it's important to use a qualitative evaluation system rather than merely quantitative one. And that's a way of, of, of tackling the issue of having an abuse of, of data. You can continue with the other question. Okay, so um, Theresia, do you have something to say on that? I mean, on the role of the human in biodesign? <laughs> You're muted, Teresa. Marie, uh, Teresa, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I uh, had the microphone. <laughs> she muted herself but... just now. <laughs> yeah, thank you for giving me the space uh, to relate. Uh, for me, the role of uh, human and in the bio design is also very important in form of uh, our perception and how we how we relate to the environment and uh, i believe that this uh, constant feedback that we acquire between uh, us and other species and other tools possibly and technologies and the way we respond, it really a lot connects also to the emotional state of our being. And um, therefore I also, as you know, and as I was presenting, dedicated part of my research into emotion, studying emotional response and how we could develop and enhance our emotional response in order to influence the environment itself. I don't know if I was, uh, coming closer to the discussion that you had before, or I'm a little bit far away because I was uh, gone for a few minutes, but um, thanks. Yeah, okay, thank you. So uh, any other comments? Uh, okay. Yeah, well, I think Rachel needs to go briefly. So maybe we can ask her whether she has some final remarks on this topic or else that have been discussed today. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm sorry, I have to go on the hour. Um, but um, uh, I think this has been a very evocative uh, conversation. And I, I think the one thing that I'd really like to get my teeth into, I know we don't have time, is really this whole idea about energy efficiency, because I think it's more about I an mean, energy generosity. We have to have energy in order to live, but it's how we transform and conserve that energy by distributing it into usefully into other networks. So it's not really about quantities for me. There's a, um, there's a set of transactions. If we think about it, life is the continual flow of energy. Let's say in the form of electrons and ions through bodies or through collectives that stay together called bodies. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a, there's a much, uh, much more interesting um, conversation to be had about you know, when we think about life, when we think about the inspirations for biodesign, what are the assumptions that we're taking from the enlightenment and imposing upon biological systems? And where are the spaces for exploration invention that the field of biodesign has an opportunity through its ethics, through its values, through the kinds of conversation that we've been having today to actually invent and create and kind of give back to these really important questions about, you know, the, the role of us living on this planet right now I'd, I'd love it to be the better than it is right now. And, and until we change our thinking and our conversations, um, you know, I, I, I don't think we're going to change much, but this kind of forum really gives me hope. <laughs> thank, thank you, Rachel. Thank, thank you. you. I, 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 thanks, ciao. I, I, one second before you go, I, I, I totally agree on the point. Um, of energy abundance or redundance uh, in a way, but and also hyperconnectivity in a way. The model should not be about maybe energy efficiency, but about hyperconnectivity of energy, how you interlock and exchange energy between multiple points on the context in high resolution. So this point becomes an exchange factor of energy in itself and a trading system. So that, that model would be, yeah a model that could uh, bring, uh, um, yeah. I, th I think that's really interesting because in that sense, you become a hub of plenty. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're able to, um, let's say, use energy wisely and accumulate it wisely, then, you know, you become a, a hub for life. So I think, I think you know, it's, it's, I, I absolutely agree with you. I thought it was great what you said, uh, uh, Claudia. I'm going to shut up now because I've got to go.
<laughs> Thank you for inviting me, everybody, and hope to see you all again really soon. Yes, thank you so much, Rachel. That has thank been great. You. Goodbye, Rachel. So thank you so much for uh, raising the question about the energy efficiency. And I do agree that um, there is not such a kind of what we call problem. So we should redefine the problem and then maybe we don't need a kind of solution just to solve the problem. Maybe we can find that sometimes the problem can also become another kind of opportunity for us to lead a, a new future about that. And I will probably jump back to our discussion on the humans role in biodesign. So uh, actually I do feel that, so through all of the presentation, I feel that the devices such as the smartphones, which collect data from our body are not directly embedded in all the human body, but the machines and the living organisms showing in the presentation have already been closely connected with human and the whole in this design. Therefore, I do agree with Maria's point that they increase the information interaction between human and other intelligent agents and enhance our perception towards itself and towards the environment. Therefore, our human and human's cognition um, is enlarged and to think of the unknown. Therefore, uh, so when we are talking about such kind of things, someone would be very frightened to see such a kind of post-human perspective or such kind of post-human future. But from my perspective, I am quite positive. I think, I do believe with the disruption of um, the traditional binary opposition between maybe self and others, between uh, mind and body. And when we rethink who we are, when we rethink what is human, actually uh, new, the new image of human is a sign that we are breaking away from these such kind of old constraints and we are opening up new ways to the future, also to human and also to the design. So uh, therefore, uh, based on our discussion on uh, what is uh, the new, I mean, the new definition of intelligence and what is the new image of human, uh, what is new artificial, I would like to um, raise the last question which is uh, based on uh, from the perspective of the demonstrator of intelligence. So the narrow definition of AI may refer to the mechanic intelligence and which is different from the natural intelligence demonstrated by human and animals. However, it becomes very interesting and it becomes more difficult for us to distinguish the natural and the artificial in such kind of post-human context, not to mention about the scope of the artificial intelligence. And from within the premises, so how do we explain the extended meaning of AI of the artificial intelligence and which this project seems to present? And I think that might be the, I mean, main idea of the topic for the biodesign, the age of AI. So Claudia, would you please just say something on that? Hi, Xiao, thanks for the question. Um, on this subject, I wonder what is, um, I answer with a question. I wonder what is the posthuman architect? How do we, because that's something that actually in the lab, in the studio, in the teaching, we have been discussing quite a lot. And it's uh, one of the topics that has been most discussed, uh, actually since the, the Italian Biennale as well, speaking, uh, Rachel is not here, she was part of this conversation as well. How do we redefine um, our role as an extended uh, body? Uh, not only in a way establishing collaboration between multiple architects, multiple, uh, you know, human, but also how do we establish collaboration in an expanded way with not leaving organisms to refit the planet? How does uh, architecture can, that is a so iconic discipline based on the style of the world be redescribed through this posthuman idea is a question that I haven't um, solved yet. I don't know if uh, anyone has a posthuman. Yeah. Could, could, could I chip in there? Uh, I, 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 I'm always nervous about all these kind of labels, post this, post yeah. that. But I would, I mean, one of the people I find really influential, I, mean, I really like his work, is Andy Clark. And he had this debate with uh, Catherine Hales about posthuman. And, and, and his argument basically is we are, I mean, this is going back to kind of a, maybe something that Maria was saying, anyone, is that we are ourselves, the, the, the kind of still, the, in some ways, it's coming from ourselves. It is the plasticity of the mind itself that allows us 
to take on board these new technologies as a kind of prosthetic extension of our imagination. So we are still intensely human. We're not post-human in that point of view. They just, it is kind of, it's precise the capacity of the human to adapt these new technologies that allows them to still be there. So that's his view anyway. And I, I tend to subscribe to that. I, I, I'm not, nervous of these terminologies. We are human, but in a post-anthropocentric perspective or the perspective I like to take where we know that uh, thinking about ourselves as a unit that control and master plan the planet is creating effectively an ecological crisis. Then if we want to take a different perspective, one in which we are have an, have an extended mind, we collaborate with other human, also non-human agency. How we actually structure that? What are the policies? What are the structures that allow us to effectively do that? Uh, how beyond, uh, and you know, for how much I love philosophy, beyond the philosophy, how does that get actualized one step at a time? How are we able to go beyond our imagination or consciousness of ourselves as a close self of the me? And we are able to expand to the to other human that co-think with us and non-human that co-think with us. How do we recognize that formally, this type of extended cognition? How do we how do we recognize that in a, in a formal manner, in an operational manner? I mean, I, I, my, my own view, it's just my view, but uh, is that actually the logic of swarm intelligence is really helpful there because we are still kind of individual agents, but we're ever aware of what's going on around us. And you can see it both as individuals, but also as a collective um, entity from the outside. It looks like a swarm. Um, but that, that'd be my view. Yeah, yeah but you know, uh, the swarm, as was pointed out by Rachel also before, it's something that can you know, there are elements of death that are part of the swarm in which the unit is totally disposed of. The hierarchy in the human system is not like this, but in, in, in a condition in which we want to overcome the humanistic view where we are the center of it, we need to understand how we reframe that without making it into a total swarm that will be inhuman in that way. Yeah, but like, I think that this question is not uh, new at all. No, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, Donna Haraway was writing Cyber Manifesto in 1985, if I'm not mistaken, or 1984. And she is questioning this uh, idea, like, uh, what matters, uh, which gender you are, if uh, basically uh, each of us now might be augmented with technology. No, what, what matters, yeah, if you are a man, or a woman, if basically you are a cyborg. Now, this, I really love this question in her statements, and I think this this question is not new. And we are uh, looking into this also ethics for quite a, a long time because actually this also referring to the Philip's question before about the ethics. I think that we are thinking on that for quite a long time. And architecture is quite a, a slow discipline, I think, and we are like uh, applying all the principles to architecture in a, in a while now. So I think that like cinema, for example, or um, literature affecting our way of thinking much, much faster, no? that we are creating some imaginary imagery that, I don't know, I remember from my childhood when I was looking to this Blade Runner and we are still <laughs> trying to recreate this Blade Runner, but no, the future won't be as it was described in Blade Runner, this Asian, uh, very dystopic vision of the environment. No, the, the future will be different and the future already now is different. We can create this, uh, I don't know, hyper connected cities. No, that's, that's, and that's going to be different. Yeah, and I think that now architect uh, is facing himself as a yeah different creature, as a different um, author. No, now we are maybe also uh, Neil is referring to the last creeds that we had uh, a few days back. No, maybe and you were saying that think that maybe we are now not designing pavilions exactly. Maybe we are now not designing structures, pavilion buildings. Maybe now we are designing the living environment through the different methods, through the different mediums. Maybe now we are designing hybrid environments, uh, digital environments, if you want biological environments. Maybe now we are uh, trying to set up 
the relationships and interconnections between the different multi-species. Maybe now it's a question of ethics. How do we decide, design the aesthetics of the our living environment in order to uh, set up a different ethics of living? Maybe that's the question of the uh, architect today. Maybe it's not about creating uh, the most optimized structure to the, uh, I don't know, uh, wind flow or creating a new uh, parametricism or new constructivism. Maybe that's not the role of the architect today because After we are my really question was another one. Sorry, when, sorry, well, probably I close you too soon, but my question no. was another one was not, I, I agree on that point, but the question that I think we have not, uh, I don't know if there are so many attempts to answer it, but uh, it troubles me a bit, is um, not what we design, but what we are as architects. We had conversation, I mean, in our research about the polycephalic model, can we apply the polycephalic model not only to the design of city, but to the way we see the relationship between ourselves? Uh, polycephalic, of, of course, means multi-headed. And for me, that is a critical question on authorship, on project, on how we evolve, you know, the design environment and are able to bring some of the idea forward and actualize it for me it's crucial also to understand how the model of how we practice and operate evolve in line with this philosophy or, or, or this way of thinking and not only what we design but how we structure ourselves and we keep ourselves to actually design yeah absolutely absolutely i do in include this uh, way of thinking about ourselves, as we were also pre previously discussed also about just generally as, as a human himself no and i think that also reflects on the the role of the personality of an architect himself yeah absolutely joined to your thoughts on that yes and i also think it's a great point to discuss uh, should we think like the fisaron so not just the design use its uh, use its thinking result to design the city, but should we just think like a fisherman? Because we know that uh, such kind of creatures they don't have the brain, but they just use the extended part of their body. Sorry, I forgot the the word which refers to uh, the fisherman. No, so I use so I describe it as the extended part of the body. So I think this is also a way maybe just like now we are doing so. Uh, maybe, uh, I mean, the thinking are not just in our human brain, but also, also it happened inside the extended part of human body, just like the devices. Then we have the whole system, we have the uh, non-human intelligence all integrated into a kind of system. And then such kind of cognition or thinking just happened just uh, uh, among these system. So I think probably this could be seen as a way just like think like the slide mode. Yeah, because uh, we are not just restricted into the, I mean, a kind of body. We're not just restricted our thinking. Yeah, so I, I think this might be a point. So any other comments on that? I think precisely as architects, as we are um, designing, uh, especially when I uh, joined uh, Claudia and Mark a few years ago uh, on photosynthetic projects, um, I started to experience that, you know, precise uh, point here is the experimentation itself that is becoming part of the design process. So the design process in itself is, uh, never ending it doesn't it, the the design process doesn't have maybe an end or a goal or a precise plan to fulfill but the experimentation is is part and we are learning through feedback loops therefore we are you know prototyping and predictable with maybe no end to the creation but we are constantly embarking on the process of uh, some successful steps, some failures, and learning through the experimentation. Hmm. I wonder if if I could try to, to build on that and, and connect that question to, to Maria's pr proposal that, that, that this, this be an ed, in part an ethical dis discussion or, or a framework for ethics. Um, I agree and I, and I 
and I am also fearful of, of that proposal in the sense that I think that our uh, language for ethics can be ter terrifically reductive and, and can, can result in, in cruelty. You're, you're with us or you're with the terrorists. That, you know, that, that is, that, that is the, the kind of cl clum, clumsy, po po polarizing, um, it, at least let's say that that's included in the territory of, of, of an ethical framing, um, that, that kind of judgment and and the, the language of retribution and 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 revenge as well as uh, as well as empathetic healing justice uh, co comes from the exercise of, of ethics today and at least in human culture and so it seems like like new generations of architects can contribute to this very much in the way that i think the the, la the last congress of siam um, in 1956 contributed some some very important things to contemporary ethics uh, that in, in that Congress, the this the sense of trying to heal the traumas of the, uh, left from from the cold the, the emerging Cold War and the, and the Second World War, result resulted in the, in the idea that rather than a pure gridded street, we would conceive of the tartan that 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 is of of a geometry where alleys were just as important as main streets and 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 we would have a topology that would be profoundly inclusive. That's an example of a formalism then, that the tartan, that the geometric system, which, which is fundamentally an ethical fr framework itself. And, and the math building phen phenomenon uh, com com comes part and parcel with that as well. The, the idea that a, a distributed topology can be profoundly in inclusive. Again, again uh, much, much more than formalism, although fundamentally f founded in space syntax and, and, and pattern languages. So if, if that's an example, then I want to ask a, a question of terminology for the absolutely extraordinary, jo joyful revelations of form that have been provided in, in this panel, and also in the technical reward structures for the, co the correlation systems and the, the, te the, the teaching uh, inputs, let's, let's say, the, 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 the pattern languages that, that are used as the forms. The, for, the first for the first part of that, I want to know if, if there could be any, any precise descriptions for these extraordinary manifolds let's say, the, 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 the filamentary tissue-like fields that we see. I'm asking that because I've, I find I flatline very quickly when I, when, when I, when I try to describe them. I, I, I'm missing language. I have, we, we, we have an extraordinary affinity. I mean, they're, 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 they're spectacularly important, we feel, when we see them. And yet, what do we call them? What are they? Do we do we stop at generic terms like manifold or or in, infolded or 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 how could you contribute some precise language to the formal structure itself? And then beyond that, could we speak? Could I ask you, please, to speak quite precisely about the reward structures and the parameters of of correlation and the, the teaching instruments and, and, and domain sets that you input, what are they? In other words, what, what, what is the building blocks and, and, and what, what divides us and what sorts us in, in order to generate this? That's a difficult I uh, was saying, Neil, uh, well, there has been um, a lot of discussion at a certain point at AA when Neil and myself were part of this conversation where uh, fields had a role, specific role and the, the conversation was beyond the AA and certain field will have a specific aesthetic and a specific visual language, but also a specific meaning in mapping certain parameters. Uh, from then on, uh, the field stopped to be called a field and became an operational field uh, at the time. And so the operational field is those fields that have a, you know, you map a specific uh, variable that is related to quantity of cyanobacteria at the edge of water and land, which relate to an index of contamination, but also acquire a specific morphology that allow you to think about ponds emerging around the landscape and, and so on and so forth. I guess uh, the fact is that how do you dance 
or balance <laughs> between the, um, the, the scientific parameter and the design one in uh, mapping elements that are ephemeral, you can't see them. So not mapping simply morphology of the city, but elements that are related to its own morphogenesis. No, with um, the, the, the land that there was the whole conversation on matter information and energy. So how do you map uh, some of these parameters, but also how the way you draw this map is, uh, is not uh, a purely quantitative uh, tool that then allow to a disconnected design evolution, but is rather a qualitative tool that allow you already to have the guideline, the mesh, the points from which then the subsequent step of your design evolve. Uh, so that I guess is um, in uh, summary, some of the as methodological aspects we work with to correlate uh, you know, data that are accurate uh, with uh, morphology that are speculative, but related to this data in a very abstract manner at the, at the beginning. But the abstraction is never purely quantitative. It's got always a qualitative aspect from which we, we then work towards uh, actualization if uh, that starts to answer your question. I leave the other to add more. Could yeah, I? Okay. No, I just wanted to maybe it's short co comment that basically this data and this mapping is becoming this bi bias, no? In the, if we are talking about the terms of AI, no? And partly this also the role of us within this process of the uh, machine learning that we are like uh, applying for quite, uh, yeah, quite recently, you know, that, uh, yeah, the, the information that we are collecting is basically affecting the final outcome. And uh, that's also, I think it's important question, how do we actually collect and what is what is this data now? So yeah, just maybe a fast comment. Neil, you wanted to jump Yeah, in. no, I was gonna respond to Philip's question about how do you describe this? And actually in some ways, I don't wanna kind of make it sound banal, but in a way, Maybe you can't describe it. I mean, the, the, there's almost like a, there was a comment made by by Yulia Kristeva uh, that um, uh, art is pre-linguistic. I don't know what she meant by that, and this is, certainly wasn't art and things. But to some level, you know, it, you know, it, 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 it. I think you reduce things once you start maybe describing things in language. And I was I was struck by the fact that we're talking English right now, but um, uh, but there were people watching in all over the world. In China, I'm sure, and they can really read that those designs without necessarily understanding the words about it. And there's something interesting about the, about just the design, the force of design itself. You know, I'm always struck by the fact that you know, if you go to IKEA and the instructions are there's there's no language. It's just simply a kind of a, a formal thing. You know, you don't have to follow the instructions in English or Chinese or Russian or whatever to put together your furniture. And I'm just wondering at some level, you know, whether there's something kind of primary about this kind of the, the visceral, about this the, this visual language we're seeing. And I'm also just on top of that, I was going to throw in another comment, and that is to say that Elon Musk was talking about this Neuralink thing, which I'm, I'm very suspicious of myself, but he said that what we'll be able to do with Neuralink is just communicate without words, because words are a way of codifying things, and they get in the way. If you could be much more immediate, and I'm just wondering to what extent this, this design work itself is much more immediate than any words that could ever describe it. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you on the point, although there is an aspect of um, how do you develop a language and a visual language has got the same type of problematic because we are used to read the city through their static morphology and not only us, also all the other people that are not part of the discipline of architecture are used to read the city through the representation of, um, of uh, the static morphology. I, always, I often do something when new students arrive to me uh, and I ask, uh, what is this? So this is not a house with a pitched roof. This is a square with a triangle on top. That's it. Uh, so <laughs> we are used to read certain aspect of, of representation of the city, but there is 
much more and there are elements that are ephemeral that we can't even see ourselves related right? to air, water, flow, bacteria, fungi, our behavior, our perception that needs to become part of the equation. And we need to start to read this part as well. And they can be part of a language that is not simply um, have a specific aesthetic, but can also enable the understanding of element that I agree. Might not, we might not be able to understand in their tendency simply through words because they have a, a level of co complexity, not to say that they are too complex, but a level of complexity that um, verbal language can't address, but material language can. And um, we, in this moment, we use material as material beyond material. So it can be digital language or, or, or the language of the pattern of the microalgae will be the same. They become a vehicle of information if we train our sensibility to actually read them as we have trained ourselves to be quite sophisticated with uh, verbal language. Maybe we should train our sensibility also in reading this pattern as effectively vehicle of information that we would not be able to grasp otherwise or discuss or entail in conversation uh, with. Um, Maybe we train ourselves to be a physiotum. Yeah, or there was a, 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 a last, sorry, I already talked too much. I say the last things, but there was this story that I read once about the Inca relationship with the God of the mountain and the way they would make inquiry to the mountain was by making cuts and look at the percolation of the sand, which of course can be an, an indicator of uh, the type of materiality, but they would uh, call it magic, right? They would call it religion. That's a way of entailing in a conversation with a geological structure, which would not speak English, Spanish, Italian, or else, uh, but would be possible to entail in this conversation through a language that expresses itself through specific patterns. So um, that's, I think, is the position in which um, it would be good to locate this, this, this conversation in terms of language, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. And I think uh, I am so excited that we have, because we start with the biodesign project, we start with the field of architecture, and then we end up with a discussion on maybe human thinking, on philosophy and everything. So I very, I, I very agree with uh, Mariana's comments, uh, which is the future architect will be hacking the display, decoding preconceptions and designing the matter of the mental spaces. I think it is very precise to describe our discussion. And I do feel like that um, what, uh, what the biodesign fascinates me uh, most is that when I am doing the biodesign project, it is also a kind of design research across disciplines, across uh, materialities and the techno uh, technologies and even the philosophical regimes. So I think uh, the standpoint of the biodesign allows more concept and approaches from the humanities to infiltrate into architecture uh, and which injects more vital force and energy to our field. Therefore, um, uh, I think the process of the design practice is also the process of the knowledge production. We're not just the design the city, we're not just produce a building or something like that. We are also produce the knowledge and the understanding towards the life, the human and everything. Hence, I think uh, biodesign in the age of AI really scales up the scope of the real and reveals a blind area in our human cognitions. Therefore, it offers an access for us to better reach the unknown. So that will might be my com all, my, all of my comments on that. And uh, I think it's time for us to reach a conclusion or give a summary for this event. So Claudia, could you please just do this work? Hi. Well, I would, uh, thanks everybody. I think it was a great conversation and everybody has contributed um, amazingly to the topic. I would like to ask uh, to the people that presented as well, Philip and Neil, whether they have any final remarks on the subject. I guess my 
my remarks were clear in the last uh, intervention, which was quite long. So, anybody? Uh, Philip. There's a, there's a rich field of new language, of form, of practice, of operations that you're contributing today. I, th I think it's extraordinarily important and sensitive work. Thank you so much. No, it was, it was extreme. I totally agree. Um, I was blown away by it. Um, I just simply say that, it, it, that we, we're finishing, but we're carrying on as it were, in the sense that next week um, we have actually also uh, an all-female presentation, Female Designers from the Arab World, a, a session that has been uh, curated by uh, Shumin Youssef, um, uh, the Florida Atlantic University was one of my students in Dessau. She's from Iraq originally, the same country as uh, Hadid. And also tomorrow there's going to be a, a theory discussion about uh, performative AI, um, which is in the DDES group, which if you look at the um, at the, the the recent um, newsletter from from those of you who got newsletter from Digital Futures, there's a link to that as well, and that's another extension of this these debates. Um, so I, I would just I want to thank thank Claudia and her team. This has really been uh, I, really astonishing, um, and I I think it's beautiful that not only are we going to see this, but we we're giving this out there to people around the world. It's wonderful to be embracing anyway. Uh, Russians and Canadians and everyone together, but it's even better to be able to kind of communicate this and distribute it to 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 people in in, in other countries that otherwise wouldn't have access to it. So this is really making the most of this platform. So thank you so much. Uh, wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you. Thanks for Austin and again Philip and Rachel to, to contribute and all our team. See you all very soon. Oh, thank you so thank much. It brought you. a lot of new thoughts also to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. I think about Thank myself you. as a Fizarum. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Have a lovely day, morning or evening. <laughs> Bye.